Um, I assume it will take people a couple of minutes to get back. So uh, uh, technical problems um, as as always. So uh, hopefully you bear with me and uh, give me a shot. So uh, So here we go. Ask me anything about securities lending. Let me know if you are back and you're uh, live and you can actually hear me uh, just for a change. Uh, and so again, what I was uh, what I was saying is that uh, I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. I run a firm called uh, Pierpoint Financial Consulting, and we focus uh, very much on uh, securities lending and the securities finance community. What does that mean? That means securities lending, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is, uh, but we'll also add in uh, collateral management, uh, um, prime brokerage, uh, and repo. So it's really a community of financing transactions that get done with securities and collateral and cash. Really, it's about financing uh, institutional investors, uh, banks, and uh, alternative investment providers as well. So uh, that's what uh, that's what this is about. Uh, and what I'll be doing actually is switching this uh, to uh, YouTube um, in a few minutes. Um, so we'll actually be doing everything via YouTube. Uh, so if you don't know our YouTube channel, uh, let me just put that up for you. Um, so we will not be switching at 105, uh, but we'll probably be doing that at about 110. Now, the idea of today is uh, for people just to be, have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, this is a, a, a more of a casual environment. So hopefully people will feel a, a little bit more comfortable to uh uh, to ask questions that you might not want to do um, uh, either live in the office or uh, during the workday, you might not have time to do that. So the idea is that because securities lending is a big business, more and more people are involved in it. You know, I, I often ask people, you know, are you involved with securities uh, lending at all? And they always say, no, no, no. That's, uh, you know, if they've even heard about it, um, they say, no, that that's for somebody else. But then if you ask them, uh, well, do you have a pension fund with your company? The answer quite often is yes. If you ask them about, um, uh, do you buy mutual funds or uh, USITs or ETFs? And they said, well, yeah, you know, many people do that. Well, if you have a mutual fund, if you have an ETF, if you are part of a big corporate pension fund, I think the chances are pretty good that you're already getting some exposure to securities lending because those are the investors that generate revenues from lending their portfolios. And let me just throw some stats out for you so you can see that, uh, just get a sense of the scale of the business. Um, it's practiced in more than 40 different countries around the world. So this isn't just for the biggest, most liquid, most developed markets. It really happens really uh, pretty much everywhere in the world, even in emerging markets. Now, um, uh, the amount that happens in every market is relative to the size of the market. So the US is the biggest equity market. So unsurprisingly, it's the biggest uh, securities lending market. And newer markets like Nigeria, uh, a much smaller uh, equity market, but nevertheless, there's still activity in that market as well. So everything's pretty much relative to the uh, size of the business. Um, so 40 countries. Now, how much is actually available for loan? There's about $25 trillion available for loan um, uh, every day. So $25 trillion of investors' assets are made available to the borrowers to borrow on a daily basis. Now, how much of that are they actually borrowing? Well, they're borrowing about uh, $2 trillion at the moment. That's That figure has been pretty stable. It kind of fluctuates a little bit above that, a little bit below that, but largely speaking, it's been that level for many years. So it's a huge market. Now, of that $2 trillion, that's a little bit ho over half of that is in government bonds. And the uh, a little bit less than half of it is equities, so global equities from around the world. 
Um, and then there's a, a, a smaller percentage of corporate bonds that get loaned out and borrowed uh, and then other assets as well. But they're really, uh, really in, in the minority. But, but look, so big government bond business, big equity activity, reasonable activity in corporate bonds. So really for traditional investment portfolios of equities and bonds, uh, there's an opportunity to generate revenue. So I talked about pension funds being big players and mutual funds and ETFs. They're, they definitely are amongst the biggest players, but there's also sovereign wealth funds. Um, as central banks have been doing quantitative easing over the last sort of 10, 12 years, uh, they have become big participants in the market where they have bought up so many bonds that they've had to participate in the market because they need to make those markets available for loan so that they can keep the day-to-day -day trading activity. Because securities lending does two things. Number one, it helps uh, facilitate short selling, which is an important factor in getting price discovery on stock markets. And the other part is that securities lending adds to the efficiency of the markets by helping smooth the path for trading and settlement. And so if I have sold something to you, and for whatever reason, I have trouble delivering that bond or that stock to you, then what I can do is I can borrow that asset and deliver it to you. You're happy and I can go sort out my problem. So securities lending plays a really critical role uh, in many markets for that kind of uh, operational efficiency factor. So really uh, an important um piece of information. So uh, listen, uh, I want to say uh, thank you to uh, the various people that have actually told me uh, that I wasn't uh, <laughs> I wasn't able to be heard before. Uh, so Mohammed, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I can't see all of the names on LinkedIn. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes they get hidden, but uh, uh, but thank you very much for for all of that. So I've been talking about the institutional investor side of things. Um, but about six months ago, I, I identified that, you know, in my view, I thought uh, retail investors would start to have a, a big impact. And and I guess there's nothing new there. I didn't create retail investors, and it's not like retail investors started doing this last year. But what I sensed was that there was quite a lot of momentum uh, building up there. And uh, that's been building over a few years, but it really started to... Uh, uh, become a, a, a meaningful figure last year, you know, with uh, firms like Charles Schwab, they bought TD Ameritrade and, and, and they both have both pro, but they both have big programs, uh, and putting them together, a very large program. Morgan Stanley bought the E-Trade business and E-Trade was big in it as well. Uh, we, you know, people have talked endlessly about Robinhood, uh, but there's also the, uh, the firm Webull and many more, these fully paid, um, programs where retail investors can benefit from lending their portfolios. Look, that's one to watch. It's had a big impact. I think it will continue to have an Im a big impact, uh, and it will it will carry on uh, from there. So, um, look, I've decided because I kind of messed up with the uh, with the sound, I'm not going to switch uh, to YouTube only. Uh, I'll do that next week. Because what we're trying to do is just concentrate the activity into into YouTube for this Q and A session. It's easier to manage, easier to spot, and uh, and easier as a resource for uh, future watchers of the replay to see all of the questions consolidated into one place. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing, but not this week. So um, look, I, I'm interested uh, for those of you that uh, uh, are watching. Uh, where are you actually watching from? So uh, share that with me in the comments. Uh, it takes about um, it takes about uh, 20, 30, 40 seconds for me to uh, uh, for me to see. Um, so uh, thanks, Vivard, uh, if that's right. Um, thanks very much for that that comment. Um, uh, oh, and that's from New York. So uh, thanks very much. Appreciate you being here early on a Saturday morning. Uh, and and look, as I said, it is a global business. So uh, you'll see uh, the newest country that is going to be bringing securities lending into the market next is the Philippines. So that'll be happening um, later this year. And people have always been surprised when I talk to them about um, 
uh, about why more markets, more of these developing markets have come into the securities lending and short selling environment um, uh, since the the global financial crisis and the Lehman default, because it sounds kind of counterintuitive uh, for uh, the crisis to have happened in 2007, 2008, and then the aftermath, and then uh, countries to say, well, we're going to bring in short selling. It sounds a little bit strange, but but just bear with me for a minute, because I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to regulators over the years uh, about this. Uh, and uh, and Bogomil, uh, thanks uh, thanks for joining us from uh, Warsaw. And uh, the Polish Stock Exchange is included in the group of people uh, that I've consulted with uh, in in the past. Um, and what they what they reluctantly understand is that short selling plays a particularly important role in moderating markets. And what do I mean by moderating markets? Well, if you think of times when you have ex um, irrational exuberance, right, where stock markets just sort of go up day after day, month after month, uh, and sometimes year after year, well, at some point, surely it must become uh, expensive. And yeah, you know, history tells us that markets only go so high, and then we have um, a turnaround, a correction, a crash, depending on how high it's gone. And what regulators realize is that as markets do this kind of inexorable sort of charge upwards, the higher the price goes, the more that short sellers look at it and say, look, this market's overpriced. I'm going to start short selling. I'm going to start selling stocks in anticipation of them going down. And that can have uh, not a dramatic effect, but it can have a moderating impact. So rather than going straight up, it kind of smooths up and it doesn't go quite as high right now they don't correct the market all all by themselves and usually some kind of a market event happens and the market stock prices start dropping and you see um uh short sellers jump in and they they, they want to make money as uh, stock prices fall so they start trading but also long investors retail and institutional investors they start selling as well and that creates kind of a momentum for a downward slope now the difference between a long investor selling and a short seller who sells is that the short seller has to buy it back in order to make a profit. Whereas the short, the long investor can just say, now I'll wait for markets to calm down and then I'll get back in. So what that does is if you think about the markets sort of falling and kind of crashing and then uh, long investors continuing to sell, but you have buyers who are the short sellers to cover their positions and book their profits. What that means is instead of that kind of straight downward fall, you have, again, a kind of a moderating effect. And so the impact of the two things means that instead of having huge peaks and huge troughs, that it kind of narrows in making markets less volatile. And so I think regulators um, uh, you know, accept that. Uh, even if they don't want to, they know that that's important. Uh, what we also see is that, um, what we also see is that uh, if um, short selling bans are implemented, and there were eight countries that did it in sort of February and March last year, uh, and in the 2008 aftermath of the Lehman default, there was like 30 countries that put in short selling bans. All of the academic um, uh, uh, evidence and research that's been released on both those events shows that what happens is because short sellers are now out of the market, uh, the spreads, the, the difference between the cost of buying and the cost of selling, that widens. Because anyone that's a buyer or a seller is taking on a riskier position, so they are willing to pay less to buy things, um, and they are going to sell things for a higher price, which means that everyone is a little bit worse off. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that um, there's just less trading. Right. If you take this this community of of traders out of the market because they're not allowed to short sell. Um, then there's just going to be fewer trades. And that's also not a good thing for people that want to buy and sell. 
And now how much happens? Uh, that varies by market. So, uh, you know, I saw some stats last week that said that in markets like the US or Japan, short selling activity could be between 30 and 40% of the market. Uh, and on some days, maybe even a bit higher. Um, markets like uh, many of the Asian markets, you'll see 15, 20% of the turnover uh, is short selling activity. So it's a pretty big part of the liquidity of markets. So um, uh, really important. And that's why regulators want it. They want it because it narrows those prices. It improves the turnover and therefore the liquidity of markets. And then the other part is that it also helps with kind of that price discovery um, uh, part of the business. And securities lending really works you know, hand in hand with that because you need to have securities lending in, in order to support the delivery aspect of short selling. There is one difference though. You know, effectively, every short sale that's legally done because it's possible to abuse short selling just like it's possible to abuse long investing. Um, every legal short sale that's done requires securities lending, but not all securities loans are for short sales because a big part uh, of the um, of the community is, or of the activity is really what we call kind of collateral transformation trades, where an investor might have one asset, so maybe a, a, a portfolio of stocks, but they need another asset uh, for another reason. So an example of that might be uh, a, a, a bank or uh, an institutional investor that has to give collateral for derivative positions, right? Because they traded derivatives, derivatives carry a counterparty risk. The way that counterparties reduce risk is by taking collateral. Uh, and they can often be pretty uh, selective in which collateral they'll, they'll actually take. So, um, if I have collateral that I want to give to you and you say, well, I don't really like uh, that basket of equities you have, Roy, uh, I'd rather have government bonds, then I have to go try and find those government bonds. And one of the ways I might get them is to do a securities borrow. I might borrow some government bonds and give my equities as collateral. So I'm transforming this basket of equities into um, the government bonds, which you will accept. So a big part of the business is done for that. And that's the biggest driver for the government bond borrowing, which I said at the start, is really half of the outstanding uh, volumes. So um, hopefully that um, <laughs> hopefully that answers uh, any of the questions. And equally, hopefully, I can figure out how to spell the word questions properly someday. Uh, which I haven't done uh, this time, so I uh, I won't waste time doing that. So my apologies for uh, the misspelling. Um, look, what I was thinking of doing in in future weeks, because I do a lot of training courses on this stuff, is I thought um, you know if there's kind of an absence of questions, what I might do is just go through the fundamentals of the business, really take people through a very high level. Of, of the key aspects of the business. So if you think that's a good idea, uh, let me know in the chat. Um, if, uh, if you don't, you can tell me that as well. I'm okay. Uh, if, uh, you know, I, I, I th I've got a reasonably thick skin, so, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Um, why don't I touch on um, GameStop? Because GameStop is the thing that everyone seems to be talking about this year. Um, I'll leave aside the background to it because I assume that um, many of you uh, have uh, or are familiar with the story. If not, again, you know, feel free to ask a question. Uh, I've done, I've written several articles in magazines about, uh, about my views on GameStop and securities lending. Uh, but let me start with just by saying that you know, what everyone focuses on quite rightly, is that the position was overtraded, right? And the position was overtraded because Melvin Capital and others uh, really, there was no way for them ever to be able to close out their positions because they were so big. The only thing that could have uh, taken them out was some kind of a corporate change or if in fact GameStop went out of business. So it was overtraded. But I would also say that uh, it was overloaned. 
Um, and one of the big things that comes up uh, quite often is this question about how more than 100% of the GameStop shares could be on loan. And it's come up at uh, each of the three uh, US House of Representative uh, inquiry sessions on, uh, on GameStop. Right, so there was just the third one this week. Uh, this one, all three have been very, very different. And this week, uh, Gary Gensler, who's the new uh, chairman of the SEC, was saying that he's asked his team to consider uh, whether there's new guidelines required for transparency and disclosures around both securities lending and short selling. And look, I, I think. Uh, I think that's their job is to go investigate those sorts of things. Um, and we'll see what they come up with. But what I just want to say is that if you take a step back, the reason that there was a short squeeze in GameStop is because people from outside the investment banking industry. So, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to call them retail investors because, you know, retail investors is such a catch-all topic or, 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 or description. You have really super sophisticated individuals that are really knowledgeable and expert traders. And then you have, you know, novices. And you also see that with institutional investors. You can see some, you know, I've met really big institutions that manage loads of money. And because they outsource the activity to uh, professionals to handle it on their behalf, they're not really necessarily always the most sophisticated people. Some of them are, some of them are the most sophisticated, but you know, I, so I think there's a mix everywhere. But so what I'm saying is that somehow this group of, for lack of a better term, retail investors was able to find out that there is, there was potential for a short squeeze of GameStop. And they did that with the current regulations, with the current disclosures, and the current information available to anyone that has access to the internet. So I'm not quite certain what it is that uh, uh, Mr. Gensler, or Chairman Gensler, as they call him, uh, is looking to get out of that. So it's not clear. You know, it's easy to say uh, I, I, I'm going to ask to improve disclosure and transparency, but the question we should really ask is why. What's the objective? What is it that you're trying to fix? If you compare the US to Europe, Europe is very different. Europe has um, uh, uh, quite a, an onerous, um, quite an onerous um, uh, regime for reporting of uh, short positions and for um, securities lending activity. So let me just take those two things separately. So for short sellers, once they cross 0.2% um, uh, of the share issue of a company in, in short positions, they have to disclose it to the regulators uh, the next day. And if they um, uh, and if they get beyond half a percent, then it becomes publicly disclosed. So there's quite a lot of information there. And that sounds to many people like it's a very good thing. The uh, downside to that, of course, is that what it does is it means that many people, many short sellers, many hedge funds, many of these investors that really act as, as watchdogs uh, and policemen for good corporate conduct, uh, they won't go beyond those uh, reporting thresholds because they don't want to disclose their positions because often companies will cut them off in terms of communication and information if the company knows that the, uh, that the investor has actually got a short position on. So what that does, the net effect of that is, is it gives air cover and protection to fraudulent companies. Okay, It provides you know, protection to other firms as well, um, but it certainly gives air cover to those firms that don't want short sellers to be uh, looking into their business. So that's one issue. Um, and so I don't think that you necessarily want to see an environment where people are discouraged from digging out fraudulent activity. Uh, but maybe you do, you know, I, I don't know, I don't. Um, if you look at securities lending, Europe also has a particularly onerous uh, regulatory regime that came in last year where lenders, 
and borrowers have to report to the regulators every day all of their outstanding transactions. Uh, the regulation is called the Securities Finance Transactions uh, uh, Reporting Regulation, SFTR. And it, it was huge, right? The work involved is huge. The amount of data that gets transmitted is huge every day. Um, and so uh, regulators have a, have tremendous information. And they also, not only do they get uh, information on outstanding trades, they also get uh, information on what's changed since yesterday, even with things that have no impact on the size of the position or the risk of the position, what we would call life cycle events. So it's a, a really onerous thing. I'm not certain what the regulators are doing with all of that data because they haven't really said what they're going to be doing with it. But there is a positive side to that, and that is companies – that now we're reporting have much more granular data about what their business is, and that in itself is a good thing. Now the question is: Is that enough to try? And, is that enough value and benefit to require the same kind of multi-year effort uh, that it took to put in SFTR in Europe? Will that make the U.S. market better? I think that's also the question. So the the trade-off with regulation should be. What is it we're trying to fix and what's the cost of trying to fix that? And if the benefit exceeds the cost and effort, then of course uh, you must do that, not just should do that. So um, watch this space. The SEC, pretty professional people in with this kind of uh, uh, investigation. So so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that whatever they suggest will be um, uh, meaningful and helpful, uh, but you know, we'll see. Um, hello to Morris. Uh, listen, and, and thanks for that question. So Morris's question is, is the growth in supply in the industry a challenge given the relatively static demand profile? So what Morris is referring to, if you go back to what I said earlier, there's 25 trillion of assets available, but only 2 trillion on loan. Well, if you go back a, a year or two, that 25 trillion was still only well, sorry, was only 20 trillion. So it's expanded really dramatically. The supply side has just grown and grown and grown. But the demand side was probably still around 2 trillion back then. And if you go back a year before that, the figures would have been lower than 20 trillion, but the demand side would have stayed at 2 trillion. So the question is why should someone get into the business if they aren't in it already? Because it doesn't look like there's going to be much appetite for uh, their extra supply. And doesn't that just dilute everyone that's in the business? That does not just dilute their return. So that's a really fundamentally important question. And it's a, it's a very good one. So thanks for that. I guess the answer to that is uh, it depends. So you'll hear me talk a lot about uh, you know it depends because there are a number of different situations. So uh, you might look at it, and and many institutional investors, uh, they will be trackers or they'll be benchmarking their performance against an index like the MSCI. And the MSCI is the most common one. So what that means is investors' portfolios in many countries, uh, they'll look very similar to each other because they're all trying to compare themselves to the MSCI. So if you have a portfolio that's not an MSCI tracker, and there's other indices uh, uh, around there, there's the FTSEs, and, you know, so there's, there's lots of other uh, indices. So if you have a portfolio that tracks that, your portfolio holdings might be a little bit different, and that could be of interest. One of the reasons that retail investors are particularly of interest is because they aren't trying to track an index, they're just trying to make some money. And so uh, retail investors are really idiosyncratic. It's whatever they've chosen to buy and hold and trade. So retail investors are also of interest. If you have uh, portfolios that are targeted at specific sectors, so there's times when the tech sector is very much in demand, and there's times when when there aren't, when they aren't. So so also you can look at sectors, and of course there's also countries. Whatever your holdings are. Um, you know that will also have a big influence on how much in demand your portfolio is. So if you hold an S and P 500 index tracker, do you know what? Save your breath, save the lawyers some time, uh, and yourself some money because there's not really much need for your portfolio right now. Uh, but if you have a portfolio 
um, that has, uh, you know, what we would call special stocks. So stocks that are very much in demand. Um, so if you look at, uh, uh, there have been times when stocks like Tesla have been not anymore because uh, short selling activity has dropped in that. Uh, stocks like Beyond Meat uh, were, were pretty pretty hot from time to time. The cannabis stocks have been hot at times and not at other times. And there's also trades, which I won't go into today, um, where uh, a company might issue a convertible bond. Okay? And a convertible bond is like a bond that under certain conditions, you can actually switch into the stock of the company without having to buy the stock. You just kind of convert your bond into a stock. And, and so it's, it's a corporate bond with an option to buy a stock. Now, the reason I bring that up uh, is really there's been a bunch of companies like Airbnb and Beyond Meat that have actually raised money from the public with these convertible bonds. And many of the buyers of these uh, funds are alternative investors that are trying to capture the option premium as a return. So they kind of neutralize the equity risk by short selling the stocks and, uh, uh, and hedge that. So th there's many different drivers, and that's been a particularly large driver of demand over the last year. So really what I'm saying is, uh, and, and the reason for mentioning those stocks is because they're very popular with the retail investing public. And so like, there's all kinds of reasons. It's something to be aware of. Um, I think you know uh, people in the market, whether they're service providers or consultants such as ourselves, they can give you people advice on whether their portfolio is good or bad, um, whether it's likely to generate good revenues or not generate uh, good revenues. Uh, and of course, if you have emerging market portfolios, there, there's always demand there. So it's it's supply demand economics 101. It's really as simple as that. Look at what the supply is, look what the demand for the asset is, and you'll find out whether it's um, worth doing or not. Okay, so I started a few minutes late. Um, so I'm probably going to go for another sort of five minutes and then, and then call it quits for the day. Um, one of the questions I touched on earlier was about GameStop and how could more than 100% of the portfolio be on loan? Um, and the good news is I have done a video on that, uh, which is on YouTube. Uh, so you can find it there either on our YouTube channel uh, or you can use that short link there, um, which is a bit.ly link. And then PFC, that's PeerPoint Financial Consulting. GME is the ticker, uh, and 140 is 140% of the stock was actually on loan. So it's a simple explainer to explain how uh, it's possible to uh, short sell more than 100% of the stock that's actually in the market. Okay. So uh, have a look at that. Um, the one other thing I want to just mention is that we also do. Uh, quite a lot of training courses. These are online on-demand courses, so you can uh, watch them at your convenience. Uh, we do free ones. Uh, so you can see, uh, uh, I think, a 15-minute video of uh, securities lending, so the basics and the fundamentals, and it'll take you through that. Uh, and there's also a similar one for repo transactions, sale and repurchase agreements. So those are two free ones. Uh, we also have a number of paid ones. So if you just go to our website and look at courses, you can uh, get some information for free. Um, and uh, and if you really like it, if you think it adds value, you know you can uh, buy other courses. Uh, if you are already in the business and you want to make yourself a even uh, uh, more knowledgeable uh, professional, we launched the PeerPoint Alpha community, where every month uh, what we provide to members is uh, training and education and tutorials. Uh, so uh, we started off by having a portfolio manager talk about how to manage a long short portfolio and the risks involved in that. Uh, then we talked about pledge collateral, which is a legal structure on, on how collateral can move. Uh, that's becoming very much an important trend and, and part of the changing side of the business. Uh, we then talked about taxation in our next tutorial uh, because in every market, there are sort of four or five degrees of taxation concerns about trading 
uh, it, it, with uh, securities lending activity that you need to understand before doing it. Uh, this month, uh, we're going to be doing a session on exchange traded funds, ETFs, because they play a really super important part of uh uh, role in the business. Uh, and also it generates quite a lot of revenue for ETF investors. So, um, it's, it's useful to understand for that. So the PeerPoint alpha community, um, is, uh, uh, is, uh, something where we deliver regular knowledge and information and also help people connect network and ask questions through the community forum. Uh, you can find the, uh, the more information on that there. So, um, look, I'm going to wrap it up again. Uh, I, I think the, the first video was, uh, was perfect. That's another one for my blooper reel. Uh, so I appreciate those of you that were in the audience that actually told me I was, uh, I, you couldn't hear me. Uh, I once went, uh, on the very, very, very first live stream that I did, uh, I went 15 minutes, uh, on silent before anyone told me. So, uh, so well done to everyone that, uh, notified me earlier. Um, that's it. That's a wrap for me. Um, thank you everyone that, uh, commented, uh, and added suggestions, um, and, uh, watched it either live or afterwards. I will, uh, I'll do my best to respond to anything that's actually in there, uh, and read what you have to say. Uh, we do this every Saturday at one o'clock. Um, so thanks very much. Appreciate your time and, uh, and attention. And I hope to see you next week.